Welcome back, everybody, for a new episode of uh, Future Bytes. We are uh, at the Hagensack Media and Health, Stage 17 at Cumulus Media. You can find our podcast on the OG Podcast Network, iTunes, and Google Play. Today, we have a, a very interesting episode. We're talking about funding, how we uh, think about our projects, fall in love with our own project, and try to get it finance and try to make it grow. Uh, I have two special ladies with me today. I have Jalak Jobanputra from uh, Future Fa Perfect Ventures and uh, Louisa Burwood-Taylor, Chief Editor of AgFunder News. Um, ten years ago, a little bit more than ten years ago, YouTube came to be, uh, came out and I started recording and posting something there. I didn't know what I wanted. I found myself in Los Angeles uh, in an environment where Italian food was not as well represented as I believe it should have been. The communication around Italian food was not what I wanted it to be. And I started posting and I was successful into scaling up and, and growing and using that technology. But I've done it all on my own. And it was super frustrating. Super frustrating in the sense that there is uh, so much about creating your own uh, environment and creating your own business that uh, requires the support of people that understand a little bit more about money, understand about the market, understand about the fashions. So I would like to hear, first of all, let us uh, let me introduce you. And uh, would you like to say something about yourself and, and what you're doing? Uh, Jalak, you start. Yes, Go, yes sure. Thanks. And it's great to be here. Uh, so... I started a venture fund about five years ago. I started my career off in investment banking mm -hmm. in 1994 uh, in media, telecom, and tech investment banking. I worked on the Netscape IPO when I was bitten by the internet and the technology bug. Uh, 97, I moved back from London where I was doing some banking and uh, started an internet company in the early days okay. of the internet. Um, while I enjoyed that, I missed doing deals. So I uh, moved out to Silicon Valley in 1999, and I started investing for Intel Capital. Uh, so 9903, I was out in Silicon Valley, kind of in the belly of the beast uh, that, during that, the internet wave, early, right? Early, years, <laughs> early, early years. And as, a, as an ethnic woman, how was it? Well. Uh, there weren't many of us. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'm interesting. I'm very happy to see you're still standing in with yes, a smile. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I have a lot of resilience, which yeah. I always say no matter what kind of entrepreneur you are, you need resilience um, because often the best ideas are the ones that are the most forward thinking. Um, now, if you add in layers of being a minority uh, of, of gender or ethnicity, that adds even more challenges yeah. and builds even more resilience. So, about five years ago, I decided you know, I have real advantages by all these years of experience, seeing the early internet, being um, a woman uh, in, in a male-dominated world, having been born in Nairobi, um, and, and just a different perspective than most other venture capitalists. And that was the same time I went to my first Bitcoin conference. And it kind of all came together that here was this technology that excited me just as much as the internet had in 1995. And I was starting a fund, and I decided to base the entire fund on a thesis of decentralization, global decentralization. And five years later, the thesis We're has played out really nicely. We're here. Yeah, that is... Uh, it's funny how things that we have thought years ago are actually finally taking shape. I always kind of like reference the comic books that I read when I was a kid. Like, with the exception of teleportation and flying cars that are almost there, it's like, it's almost everything there. Like we don't live on the moon, we, we you know, but we do have an international space station. Like the, the world is, uh, it's getting the shape of our mind. Yeah, and I tell my niece and nephew who are seven and six, uh, and they bought into this, so this better happen that they're going to be in <laughs> know, autonomous right? flying cars, and <laughs> they think they're not going to have to learn how to try. <laughs> and you, Luisa, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my background is as a financial journalist. Um, so I've worked at a couple of trade uh, publications during my career. I started off covering the exciting world of structured bonds. Um, wasn't exciting, by the way. 
<laughs> and then I got the chance to move out to Hong Kong for three years, which mm -hmm. was fantastic. And I covered equity capital markets there. I had a really exciting time where there were brands like Prada doing IPOs out in, in Hong Kong. So that was awesome. And then I went over to the Financial Times and launched for them um, a new service that focused on institutional investors in Asia and where they were investing their funding. And alternative investments was really something that was starting to pique mm -hmm. their interest. I think Asia was a little bit behind in terms of that. And alternatives, you know, ranging from... Um, oh, sorry, I've gone blank. Oh, please, it's all good. <laughs> so, uh, multifunding investments. So, are we yeah. talking about I investments so, in, in different branches? Yeah, so, maybe agribusiness, uh, industrial... Exactly, exactly. So, outside of typical stocks and bonds, um, yeah, infrastructure. And then agriculture was one area that was starting to be somewhere where investors were looking at investing. And so when I moved back to the UK, there was a company called uh, Private Equity International, um, and they were launching a new department where they were looking at niche areas of investment, and agriculture was mm -hmm. one of those. Yeah. And so I was the founding editor of Agri Investor. Um, and did that for a few years. And that was looking at investing across the agriculture value chain. So investing in farmland as a sort of real estate type play. Mm -hmm. And then investing also in agribusinesses, like big private equity transactions. And then there was this small portion called ag tech, which was the venture capital funding um, space. And I remember that my coverage was a couple of deals every week, if that. Um, and then 2015 happened and we had like, it's a sort of a historical year in the, in the ag tech world where there was a lot of funding. There was about $4.6 billion of venture capital funding went into agriculture technology startups. Okay. And at that point, I moved over to Ag Funder to focus purely on that. I'm really interested to hear from you because you do have the inside eye and you see what's happening out there. Okay, so as far as I am concerned, as a normal human being that doesn't necessarily do well with numbers and investment all the time, but... On one side, I see blockchain as, as a system that is revolutionizing the world, not just from the cryptocurrency-based uh, you know, deployment of the technology, but also as a way of carrying on information, being the heritage, being recipes, being history that cannot be rewritten by anybody, which I find uh, extremely important, especially in this day and age where you know every opinion is a piece of history, which is not what it is. Uh, but I would like to hear from you where do you see the, these investments happening? Where do you see the shift? Like one of the things that is interesting me a lot is uh, uh, the world of agriculture, because I grew up on a farm, fell in love, ended up in LA, and now in New York, and I have spent 20 years in Metropolis, and I cannot take it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I need to go back there. And I have noticed a lot of my friends, or even chefs, uh, that decide to leave behind uh, the city to go live in a place where they can get more space, we can get better produce, uh, we can maybe raise their animals. Sometimes this, those, th this operation requires an investment, requires a, a different approach that is our traditional approach in the city. So I would like to hear from both of you, where do you see the change and, uh, and, and eventually discuss you know, what can be the tools for people that want to shift to the agribusiness or shift to tech and food, let's call it that way, because that is my world, but you can paint to the broad strokes. Would you like to start? Sure. So uh, we focus on blockchain applications uh, across different verticals. Okay. So financial services, healthcare, food provenance, uh, supply chain provenance. Um, so I'll speak uh, more broadly about mm -hmm. the promise of the technology, okay. and then Please. Lisa can, and can take the, the, the agriculture piece right of on. it. Um, what excited me when I went to that first Bitcoin conference, um, and, and Bitcoin was really created um, as a system uh, post-financial uh, crisis of 2008 uh, to allow people to take back control of their money. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, mm -hmm. the anonymous creator of uh, the whole kind of Bitcoin protocol and, and software, uh, was kind of fed up with the banking system and felt that they had failed us and that um, uh, the banks hadn't been good custodians of our capital. So he thought, computers have been used for so many other things. We use them on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, to look up information, other, other means. Why can't we use computers to verify transactions, keep our money safe, kind of replace the banks? Um, 
And so he created this whole system of verification across computer nodes where no one entity has control. Or can interfere. Or right. can interfere. Uh, because copies of this ledger are, are kept across thousands of computers, and there's no one central point of failure. Uh, so, so that was pretty um, revolutionary in, in putting together. And it was, it was this system of cryptography but also incentive systems. So anytime a computer verified a transaction, they got a little bit of Bitcoin in return for completing that transaction. So everyone within that network was incentivized to be a good uh, citizen, a good player, a good you know, player so because nobody wanted the price of Bitcoin to, to go down. And the more usage there was, the the the, bet, the higher the price yeah. uh, would be. So, and, and that application of that currency element can be used for any data. So food provenance, there, there are lots of issues with, is, is this really organic? It says it's organic, but do we know where it's been and, and how it was grown? And if you could start to put all of that information on a global ledger that you know can't be tampered with, Absolutely. Um, then you have a better idea of what you're buying. Um, I, I think that eventually is going to help with food waste as well, yeah. because uh, it is, it's going to be harder to smuggle or fix books uh, or just move uh, items for point A to B skipping. Like it, it, it's going to force producers and buyers to, have, uh, to be more aware which is actually just life. Like, you know, keep your eyes open and make sure that there is a transparency. Uh, what have you seen in the uh, agribusiness, Luisa? So in terms of um, bringing people in to invest in, yes. in the space, yeah. Well, so that was one of the things that really excited me about AgFunder and why I joined the company. There's so two parts to the business. Well, no, the main business is is uh, crowdfunding, or it started off as crowdfunding, okay. with the idea of um, bringing more people to be able to invest in agriculture. It wasn't an area that people typically thought of investing in. They were thinking of, as I said before, stocks and bonds. So our founders realized that there was this big funding deficit in agriculture. There were a huge number of projects that weren't getting funding. And I think it's probably a function of the fact that a lot of people just weren't as familiar mm -hmm. with agriculture. They didn't really understand the ins and outs. And as I'm sure you know, the food chain is incredibly complicated. I, you know, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> and I lived uh, the uh, the vacancy. Like I've seen all the sons and the daughters of the farmers that used to work with my grandfather leaving in the 70s because they wanted a better life. Right. We had this idea of the city as the place where you had to be, which is, you know, for obvious reason, you know, more connections, more opportunities. But I've seen the country getting yeah. empty. And now I'm seeing the return to it, me included, that finally I feel that I do have not just the opportunity, but tools that are better fit it, better suited to who I am uh, now. And actually, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, I do have uh, uh, one question right away. I am older than the traditional, you know, startup guy that has, uh, you know, 20 years old, uh, develops an app or develops something. How has it changed the, the approach to fund seeking for a new generation? I'm sure that things are wildly different from what our parents, you know, from the way that our parents raised us. Meaning, like, uh, how how are these investments working for you know the junior new generation? Yeah, so I think I think um, it's a lot of it's about bringing it into the public domain more and, and increasing the education around agriculture and food um, amongst the general population, and whether that's you know finding out where their food comes from and learning being more interested in that. Mm -hmm. And I think the younger generation are more engaged, and so I think a lot of the technology, a lot of the food companies are actually trying to catch up in terms of that sort of educational piece. And what we've tried to do is try and educate the investors market through this platform where we have the news and the research side as well as the investment side and taking this kind of platform venture capital approach we're hoping to kind of bring more people into the space that might not have looked at it before and hopefully that will be younger generations as well you've got a lot of very young entrepreneurs looking at agri-food coming from lots of different angles a lot of them from sustainability angles um, and so hopefully we're kind of taking everyone along with us on this, this do, great journey. Do you see um, this investment reflecting what traditionally farming and agribusiness is, or do you see also a lot of uh, tech, alternative proteins, uh, sustainability? Is uh, is uh, are there projects that are in align with uh, you know hyper tech or or tech in general, or more traditional kind of farming? 
yeah, it's def for the younger generation specifically, it's more, it's more tech enabled. I mean, there's definitely, as I mentioned before, in my previous role, I was writing about farmland funds and people are investing in those, but they're much bigger. You know, those funds are hundreds of millions, um, whereas startups are raising, well, sometimes that much, but at smaller <laughs> amounts. So they can. it might be a little bit more easy piece to chew for, um, for other, you know, everyday investors. But yeah, I mean, the technologies that are being applied to agriculture and food range from blockchain to satellite imagery to drones, um, gene editing on mm -hmm. the biotech side there's a huge sort of plethora of technologies that are being applied to agri-food now um, and it's really exciting and I think it was left behind as an industry uh, McKinsey says it's the least digitized industry in the world which considering it represents 10% of global GDP is yeah. it's crazy and also the, the amount of land that is devoted to that, that right, there is absolutely. so much that can be yeah. done so it's a big catch-up at the moment and you're seeing these technologies from other industries coming into agriculture okay uh, Jalak, do you see the uh, the path uh, to accessing finances being different, uh, uh, more traditional? Like, are people coming up with the ideas and being able to uh, approach I investors or, or capitals in a different way? Or the path is uh, still following those economic rules that, you know, you study in college? Well, we had a major development last year, which was really the birth of the initial coin offerings. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it... Uh, Ethereum, which is uh, another cryptocurrency, uh, uh, which was kind of is the second largest uh, mm -hmm. cryptocurrency behind Bitcoin, actually did an initial coin offering back in 2014. But it was only last year that we saw kind of thousands of, of companies raise capital uh, in a similar way to mm -hmm. what Ethereum did, which is um, you know, offer up an investment opportunity. To in anyone, the form of a, of a token, right? In the yeah. form of a token. Yeah. So they would issue a token in exchange for some capital. And now the tokens aren't really worth like, anything. Right. Uh, and, and there are no rights associated with those tokens. But it was a completely unregulated market last year. And, and so once one company started to do it, or Ethereum. So Ethereum's price really started to rise last year, as did Bitcoin's. Uh, there were a number of reasons for that. One is that uh, there was just a lot more uh, positive regulation coming out of places like Japan right. around this technology. So once those price rises started to happen, entrepreneurs started thinking, well, well, Ethereum did it, you know, is there a way for us to issue a token? But isn't it, isn't it issuing tokens a, a way of saying, this is a value, but I'm not giving you shares of the company? Well, it is, but the whole idea, now with Ethereum, you know, the whole idea is, and if you go back to Bitcoin and the economic incentive of uh, holding some Bitcoin uh, and then uh, and, and, and being, um, being part of a network that did verification uh, would increase the value of that Bitcoin with Ethereum was using this uh, token to build other applications, right. use it as a way to build other applications uh, that would then be used. And, and so the value of the Ethereum token would, would go up as more and more decentralized applications were built on it. Um, so actually, I do think it makes sense for mm -hmm. certain business models. There's there are companies that are uh, using it for storage. So they, they want to build out decentralized storage, where if I can use some of your computer storage mm -hmm. um, uh, in return for a token or a part of a token, and if I want, a, you know, it depends on how much storage I want. Right, absolutely. So, so that's creating your own, like, uh, marketplaces around, uh, instead of having to go through Dropbox right. or, or these centralized services. So I think there's something really exciting Exciting about this. The, the problem is that there hasn't been a regulation or delineation on, you know, what is the capital really going to be used for? How is the token really going to accrue value other than just being used as a fundraising right. mechanism? And I, I want to go back to something you said in, in terms of agriculture. I mean, one, one development I've seen is um, coffee growers, mm -hmm. you know, often uh, they kind of don't get the full value of, of what they're contributing to the value chain. Yeah. Um, there are tokens that are being issued that would allow, once you can track the provenance, the, uh, the actual growers would be able to get the right percentage of what they're owed through that value chain. Yeah. And, and so that's where I see huge social impact, um, you know, kind of more 
um, more value flowing to the actual creators and the growers. Uh, exactly, yeah. and, and actually this uh, brings it back to Visa. This is uh, almost like, um, I, I don't want to call it community building, but there was this idea of being in the agribusiness was isolating yourself from civilization. All of a sudden you have a business that brings you in the middle of the fields. You are, to a degree, at the disposal of the weather, because you know a couple of days of bad weather can destroy everything you have, but now we have different kind of technology. But um, it is uh, we're still connected, and it's still you know going back to the farm. It's it's not going back to the farm these days. Do you see people accessing this kind of investment, uh, living life in the farm the same way that they would live it in the city? So using tokens, using these tokens as their currency, utilizing this, the same path that brought them to the investment, staying connected with that, with that as opposed to isolating themselves, is it is almost a way of urbanizing the the idea of living in the country but not building in the country. Oh, absolutely. And there are some um, apps that are being developed which are farmer-to-farmer -farmer networks to enable them to see what each other's doing on their farm and use that data to help them make better decisions on the farm. Uh, and I think, you know, in the US, for example, the farming population is aging. I think the average age is close to 60. Yeah. Uh, so to bring, when the new generation takes over, which hopefully they will, they're going to be more tech savvy anyway. Absolutely. And so the adoption of these technologies will be quicker. Uh, in markets like Latin America, the actual average age is a lot younger. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how that adoption goes. But I definitely think, we're, you know, a lot of people are talking about this as being an appealing thing for younger generations to oh, go back I, to the farm. I, bought, I remember buying a domain like 17 years ago. I renewed it yesterday. It was farmers with laptops. Like I had this idea even before that I, even before I came to the US I always looked at my my family land as a, not a place where I could just be in there with a the shovel and, and bleeding calluses on my hands but trying to figure out or envisioning a way where like I'll be sitting under my tree with a laptop that is connected that is telling me when the rain is coming that is telling me what is going to be my perfect moment to harvest that is going to help me network with to talk about farming equipment, the kind of, uh, you know, immense expense. Uh, so this is a way from the founding perspective, it can also be very useful because, you know, think about sharing farming equipment, being able to invest on a property and connecting with a neighbor that has different kind of equipment and being able to share that kind of stuff. Who do you see, um, is there something that is exciting you about this, uh, this change? Is there a trend uh, that you have seen happening that is like, wow, this is, unforeseen, this is uh, revolutionary, or just something that excited you? I mean, I find it all exciting. <laughs> it's kind of like choosing you, which is your children is your favorite. Um, I think, you know, there's a huge sort of, there's lots of areas of, of hype and overexcitement. I think vertical farming mm -hmm. maybe has been one of the areas that's been covered a lot in the mainstream yes. media. And when we, you know, us in the sort of in the biz, it's Well, especially actually... in New York, because we don't have any fields. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you know... exactly. <laughs> um, in the biz, you know, there's not actually been that many startups in this industry that have raised a lot of funding until last year. And there was a big vertical, uh, the big, I say, there was a vertical farming startup called Plenty that raised $200 million with the biggest funding rounds in the industry from SoftBank, um, mm -hmm. a Japanese uh, a, a fund that they got over there. And um, that really sort of uh, turned eyes on this space and, and thought, okay, this has gone mainstream now. And so I think it is exciting to see how this vertical farming will roll out. And actually, I was talking to someone the other day, thinking about, you know, uh, the sustainability issues with the industrial farming model and um, the, you know, ecological practices and actually how vertical farming could be done alongside more sustainable farming practices and hopefully it's gonna maybe take over from industry. On, yeah. on the soil. Right. You know, this ultimately is it. exactly. it's gonna so it could, you know yeah. allow us to allow our fields to, to breathe. A little exactly. bit. Exactly. Um, and also bring, um, hopefully bring food to some food deserts as well in certain cities. Well, what about what about insects farming? Like we have done an episode here where we talked about alternative proteins and, and yeah. crickets for example and uh, look like I am an obnoxious cook, Italian cook that, you know, my wife doesn't like to go to restaurants with me because I usually find something to, to criticize about it. <laughs> um, and I, I am a carnivore by default. However, I don't know if it's growing. I don't know if it's having kids. I don't know if it's getting a little older and, and having, I don't want to say wise, but looking at the world with the eyes of somebody that has passed a few years, I am starting to realize that that's kind of like the only hope that we have. 
to be able to differentiate, to be able to generate vertical farming so we can bring back sustainability on the fields. And I do see that happening with proteins as, as well. Um, we have about five minutes left, but I really would like to hear from the both of you, what is uh, the path from, uh, in these days, from the idea and putting the idea in place, and let's talk about the kitchen, let's pretend I have a new ingredient on an appliance, from there into finally reaching the, the capital fundraising that is not your friends and family. You know, let's talk here around B or, or a seed or, or, you know, I'm, I'm even myself coming from a farmer kind of, hmm, you know, how do we do that? So you come up with an idea uh, and we're really speaking to people that are at home that might be thinking about either changing their work or getting into the, you know, business with, with an idea. What is the ideal path? Well, so I always tell entrepreneurs that venture capital is a very kind of small subsector of overall funding mm -hmm. options. Um, and it only really works for entrepreneurs who want to build very large businesses. So when I make an investment, I'll value a company, say I value it at $5 million, I would look at at least a 10x return on that. Yeah. So it would have to sell for at least 10x of what I valued it at. Um, and, and so... One of the first things I assess when I talk to an entrepreneur is how big of a business do you want it to be? Do you want a board of directors, external board of directors that owns some of your company? Mm -hmm. And are you willing to collaborate? Do you um, want to risk to lose your company one day? Right, right. Or question. be replaced yeah. uh, if, if you're not performing according to the uh, return expectations. So it's, it's a very specific type of funding. Now, what's great these days is there are more and more funding options available to entrepreneurs, such as crowd funding. Uh, you can certainly go after loans, especially if you're in, in the impact-oriented space. There, there are more and more entities that are offering, you know, below market loans or um, in, in incentives um, if, if you're, you know, creating a better world. So um, sometimes I, also young entrepreneur, right? Young entrepreneurs can have so certain, you know, degrees of facilitation, like at least in Italy. I'm thinking about my daughter that eventually one day will turn 18. I'm like, you need to go get to work because, you know, the UN does have, you know, agri funds available and I'm too old for that. Yep. So, uh, so grants that's a, that's from universities. Yeah. And so there is a lot of funding outside of venture capital. Obviously, I'm a big believer in what a venture capitalist can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And even with this ICO boom that we saw last year, a lot of people thought, oh, well, venture is dead because these entrepreneurs can go anywhere for funding. No, what I've seen yeah. is even for the entrepreneurs that want to issue tokens yeah. from a broader market, they're still doing small rounds of funding oh, to get kind of the input of a board and the input of Well, of I, I do know companies that have been raised their capital on Ethereum, and there are days where they're like, uh, we don't know how they're going to pay it, actually, because the company is floating on, on a currency that is so... That fluctuates so yeah, I much. I mean, the smart entrepreneurs figure out a way to liquidate Scale portions it. Yeah, exactly. of it. Um, but, but, you know, while it was still going up, a lot of them didn't think of doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and for you, Luisa? Yeah, well, I think in the agri-food technology world, there's a lot of resources on, you know, probably within the venture capital model, but there's accelerator programs and incubators and challenges. Um, and there's over 100 of those available globally now to entrepreneurs. So I think that's a very good place for many of them to start. Do you see that, um, are they more uh, private or is there a mix uh, in, when it comes to institutions, obviously there is access to government funding. What is the the path of least resistance? Is this a... Uh, would you suggest to somebody getting into the agribusiness to connect with their local institutions or private funding or, or both? I mean, I come from a land uh, in Italy where if you want to do anything, you need to be connected with the local people. You know, so yes, you might say I'm arriving on my own land with money. You still need to ask permission to do certain kind of stuff. Uh, I needed to ask permission to paint my house a certain color. So, <laughs> what color <laughs> was about, it? <laughs> well, no, because it was, it's an old house, and they they wanted you know mineral color that changes through the years so that is going to look aged after a certain point. But you know, when you talk about the agribusiness impact, for instance, you cannot come to Tuscany and cut olive trees to start planting something different. So there are rules that that go you know by that. There was really no question attached to that. I just <laughs> rambling about that. But um, there is a, there is a so much still to learn. W where do you see the next uh, the next big step in investing? Like, let's close with that. Where do you see uh, the new coming 
is there something that is exciting ahead in terms of like, you know, in investing or access to capital for people that want it? Yeah, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this as well. But um, there's this talk of using um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to help investors identify investment opportunities, um, looking at things like the quality of the team or the quality of the idea. Um, and that sort of adds a more scalable um, way of investing. Just interested, what do you think it's about frightful. that? It's frightful. Yeah, G- I, giving, I mean, giving AI, Like asking AI, what do you think about my idea? Well, I, I, I would say, so I've been investing in artificial intelligence that. since like 2001. Mm-hmm. So this is an area I've spent a lot of time and it's kind of also exploded over the last few years. Um, look, AI has gotten a lot better because we have more processing power. The chips we use, you know, if we look at our smartphones, um, there's more processing power in that smartphone than NASA had when they sent a man to the moon. <laughs> so so that, so yes, there, so that means there are more calculations that, um, and, and AI is getting better. How However, we're still far off from being able to replicate the human brain and right. decision making. Um, so I, I think it can be used up to a certain extent, but I think it'll be a long time before um, you know, AI can replace that that last mile of decision making mm-hmm. uh, and assessment of, of different Maybe parameters. Maybe kind of help you find the like the, the better options, right? And yeah. and frankly, you know, I've been a VC for 20 years, the best investments have been the outliers. I mean, I'm sure if I asked an AI five years ago, what do you think of blockchain? I mean, blockchain didn't really even exist. So um, that would have been a negative. Um, I I, I do believe that good investment also always requires a little bit of emotion attachment. You know, it can be just the feeling of having skin in the game, but you you need to feel it. There is a gut feeling to, not just to coming up with an idea, from somebody that is looking for money because they have to believe in the product and from somebody that is actually willing to invest their client's money or their own money into an idea. So, yes, you can have all the artificial intelligence that you want, but you, you need to feel it. <laughs> otherwise, Agreed. Uh, otherwise, it won't happen. Uh, Jala, Lisa, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, I wish you all the best in your endeavors and I uh, hope to have you back one day. Maybe we'll be on TV as well. So we got <laughs> Thanks so for having us. Uh, from uh, the Hackensack Media Studio uh, in Penn Plaza, goodbye. Future Bites will be back on the OG Podcast, uh, Podcast Network and next week with the new episode. Be well, everybody. Ciao. <laughs> Don't let go, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go.